Good morning. Good morning. Aloha. Okay. Or Representative Faye Hanohano. Oh. Oh. Um, we are here today and one of the most beautiful places here on our beautiful island mm -hmm. um, at the Hilo Hawaiian Hotel. Mm -hmm. And we're gathered to discuss some recent events that have happened at the Hawaii State Legislature. Um, uh, you gave me a packet of information. Thank you very much for this to give me some background. And it looks like for this legislative session, trouble began when a young man by the name of, it, it actually began on February 12th with a letter that, that this young man, he was a H. PU student, is yes, that correct? Yes, is that, that is correct. And he testified before one of your committees. Which committee was that? This is the Ocean Marine Resources Hawaiian Affairs Committee. And the discussion was on the, um, the shark protecting the mano. And so when he came to testify, he was really unprepared of what he was really saying. So I just needed clarification. So what I did was, because I took, you know, an interest in what his interest was into protecting the mano, so I was trying to explain that we needed to know a lot of our history before we could, you know, do a protective clause for the mano, because the mano is very important in our Hawaiian culture, whether it's somebody's aumakua, somebody's god, whether some people used it for... Um, a resource to make our pahoa, our clubs, our war clubs, or whether we even used it for food, for mea ai. So when I started to explain to him, like what would happen if we protected the sharks and the shark took over the beach? And he had no response. I mean, he was so adamant that we really needed to protect it. So I just told him the story like, um, what if my tutu was so ono for shark? Would I deprive her of the food that she grew up with? And tutu is like in her 90s. I mean, you know, it's almost time for her to leave our beautiful home and go to a greater home. And he just did not understand what I was saying to him. And being that this was his first time testifying, I knew he wasn't prepared. So I tried to explain that all to him, but apparently he wasn't listening. He felt offended. And he said, I didn't know anything about ocean marine resources. And here I've been living in these islands, born and raised in the Puna area. And we have a lot of coastal and we do a lot of um, harvesting at the sea, whether it's for limo or opihi or fishing along the coastline or even ikashibi along the coastline. So, I mean, for him to even make statements like that in his email is so heavy, it's so wrong that it needs to be corrected. So I'm glad I do have the opportunity to explain myself or what really happened there. And if he had listened and taken to heart the lessons that were being given to him, he would have left the committee in a better spirit and a more fulfilling and educational um, student. But apparently he decided to hide behind his email and send information that he perceived as being correct. This is his name, Lewis Edward Aaron Jacobs, and he says he's in the field of environmental studies. He wrote to our um, representatives on February 12th. Less than a week later, the director of the Department of Land and Natural Resources, William Isla, yes. wrote to the Honorable House Speaker, um, Joseph Suki, and he alleged his own um, list of, of allegations against you. Yes, and a lot of these allegations, if you look at it, out of the five, two has invalid dates. And if you look at it, the um, signature that's signing off for him is his deputy director, Esther Kia Aina. And my understanding, when I requested information from Mr. Ayla, if, you know, he had leaked out this information to the media, and he, I have a copy that says he hasn't leaked it out. So a lot of this information that the media has been gathering is generated from, I only can presume, 
from the House Majority Leadership and our Communications Director, Carolyn Tanaka. Um, I was going to um, ask you about um, William, uh, William Isla's allegations, but along those lines, since you believe that information is being leaked out from that um, House, Media. House Speaker or the Communications Director, do you kind of feel like you're involved in a witch hunt? Yes, I definitely do. Why? And, and I think um, people are just, um, Hawaiians would say, maka'u or afraid. It's because when I start to speak in English and Hawaiian or Hawaiian in English, and I flow into both of them because I do understand both sides. And people don't understand actually what I'm actually saying. And even if I do translate for you, because our language is so rich, you need to go to the deeper land. It's what we call um, hohonu. But a lot of times, a lot of these people are papa'o, so shallow that they don't get the message. Uh, Hawaiian language is filled with double entendre. Yes, and that's I what we say. call the kauna. And, and if, you, if you read through William Isla's complaints, it's kind of along the same. He has a double standard because he's saying that I needed to explain to his administrators what I meant, especially when I was speaking in my mother tongue, you know, Olelo Makohini. And it's very double standard because I have seen um, Chairperson Ayla at, a, at blessings and at events where he does olis and it's never translated. So now he wants me to translate for his administrators. So I did introduce a resolution for him to train, for the, uh, the head of the Department of DLNR, to train their administrators in Hawaiian history, Hawaiian language, so they would have a better understanding and a better focus of our aina and our navaivai, you know, our land and our resources, because this is what their kuleana is, they're responsible for all of our natural resources, our lands and our waters. But when you don't have the deeper understanding in our Hawaiian perspective lens, then it's hard to really um, get your kuleana done or to, to achieve you know, a better standard and move Hawaii to a better place. It seems as if you, if you step away from the complaints themselves and, and look at the overriding theme, it seems as if you have been misunderstood, like as if maybe, I mean, and this is where I want to get your point of view, you, you're in an effort to educate people about Hawaiian history and Hawaiian culture. Is, is that where you're coming from? That's when where I'm coming from when I do, yes, when, when I'm explaining things. It's to clarify things, but... It's unfortunate that a lot of these people we hire, they're not from, they're not born and raised here, one. They come from um, what we call Aina E, the mainland, and then they come with the more uh, Western perspectives, so they do not come with uh, native indigenous lands. So when they're looking at the same things, like we both can look at a rock. The Western person would say, it's just a rock. A Hawaiian person would say, oh, Apohaku, you know, and they would have a relationship. And this is what the Western lands does not have the pilina, the relationship with everything around us, because an, an indigenous person would place themselves right in the center and look at everything around them. They would look at the Vaulani, the, our skies, we look at our Vaukele, our forest lands, our Vaukai, our sea, and then what we would do is we would work with the resources. We would not try to change it. So when they're talking about climatic change today, I have a hard time with it because there is nothing we can do to change mother nature. We can do prevent all the preventive measures, but that's already been proven because in the 1960 lava flow in Kapoho, they built dikes to stop the lava from flowing. And being, because this is a mother nature force, and being a mother also myself, we're going to do what we need to do for survival. So the lava flow will never be stopped by a dike. And they also did it in one of the lava flows up on the Hilo side, on the Mauna Loa flows. 
And so when we talk about climatic changes or changes to our seas, our rising seas, and what's happening in the world, um, I really have a hard time with it because people need to adapt to what's happening around instead of trying to change it. Because when you do a lot of changes, especially in ecosystems, like how you want to change you know, to protect the mano in the ocean, now what happens to the other species in the ocean? What happens to us as human beings or Kanaka Maulis? What happens to our sustainability or our enjoyment at the beach? We want to au kai because we need our exercise physically and mentally. We go down there to meditate so we can clear our mind of all the heavens in this world and we can come back to our state of malukia, of finding ourselves in a loving and peaceful world where we all need to be. But people today haven't even gotten to that point. And also in our Hawaiian um, perspective, the golden rod is to be a kanaka, kanaka makua. And a kanaka makua is one that is very matured in everything and it doesn't matter what the age is. It's like today people call me a kupuna and I'm always telling them, no, I'm not there. But then they'll tell me I'm a kupuna because of the wealth of ike and knowledge that I have that puts me there in their status. But for me, because of my age is 60 right now, I don't consider myself a kupuna. And if I'm doing a lot of um, outreach work in teachings and stuff, that's part of me because in our Hawaiian culture, we're very accepting, we're very accommodating. And I can remember when I was a young girl, we always used to invite people over to eat. And then I used to tell my mom, Mom, why are you inviting them to eat? You haven't prepared anything. And then she goes, that's okay. And then she starts to have the conversations with the people. Then she starts to prepare the food. After the food is done, then we all eat together. And this is how we establish Pilina, our relationship with people. And once we know who our neighbors are, then at least we know our Kauhaleo village would be a better place to be because everybody is living in Lokahi, in harmony, everybody is at their Maluhia state of being at peace and loving. So this is what it's all about. It's the expressions of really Maluhia, of living lovingly and peacefully. And if we're gonna do big decisions, we need to come from that point of view and we need to be at that state instead of having all the emotions running where you tend to not do sound decisions. So that's how you got, get a lot of the heva, a lot of the wrongful type of decisions. You received um, um, a disciplinary action from the House Speaker, Joseph Suki. He, they're now monitoring or saying they're going to be monitoring your committee meetings. Yes, but that's not true because I just had an um, informational briefing on Wednesday, March 5th. Nine o'clock, I had the um, informational briefing on Opihi. And then at 10, I had an informational briefing on OHA. And there was no one from the speaker's office or from the House majority leader or in leadership that was there to monitor. However, before that, I always had this other person, CJ Leon, coming in to monitor. So I used to just, you know, laugh it off, you know, and just tell people, oh, we have a babysitter, you know, a kahu keiki. Do you, do you feel like, um, that, well, they're not following through with what they're, yes, they're saying? Yes, I certainly do. And I did not sign for the letter. I refused to sign it, and I did write that it was unacceptable and it was one-sided. There was actually a, a, a proposed Proposals. House resolution yes. to, to censure you. And do you know who put forth this resolution? That was put forth from leadership by Speaker Suki and Majority Leader Scott Psyche. And for your information, um, Mr. Jacobson is a constituent of House Majority Leader Representative Psyche. Oh, um, and also, Jacobs. Yes, Jacobs. And oh, then okay. also... On the letter from DLNR, it was at the request of the House leadership that asked DLNR to send in the letters okay. and the complaints. So where do you feel like you fell on the other side of... of well, what had happened was I had some colleagues that was unhappy about the beach bill. 
So we had made a decision and it got deferred on the first reading. Then later on, the um, chair of Waterland, Representative Evans, brought up the bill again and she had asked um, me to re-sign it if I wanted to um, redo the decision making and we can't do that and I told her no. Then she went to my vice speaker, Representative Colin, and he also declined to sign off it. So then she ended up with our vice speaker, John Mizuno, who signed off but he didn't really know all of the details. So we did, they did um, schedule um, decision making on that bill again. And then at that um, decision making, I was not there due to the fact that I was hosting Office of Hawaiian Affairs because this was um, January 31st and I was um, hosting them for their informational briefing. And then they were also having a fellowship with all of the legislatures. It was a meet and greet. And since I was the hostess, so I needed to be there. I mean, of course, you know, a hostess never leave the party, right, or the event. <laughs> I mean, that would be so ungracious in a Hawaiian perspective. So what <laughs> happened after um, John Mizuno signed so the bill for Cindy Evans? Yeah, and then, and then it did get that hearing on that same day on January 31st. Did you end up exchanging words with Cindy Evans? No, I, have, I didn't exchange no words with Rep. Evans. I only talked to um, my vice chair, Representative Colin, because he came up for advice. And I told him, well, you do what, you know, your na'au tells you. You do, you move by what your, your um, true feelings are going to be about the bill. And he told me he was not in concurrence with the House Draft 1. So I said, well, then you would have to defer the matter on the side of the Ocean Marine Resources as the vice chair, since I wasn't available to um, assist him with the um, decision making. So he did that. And then that same day, Friday, after our session, I see an interaction between Representative Evans and Speaker Joe. And then lo and behold, on Monday, this is February 3rd, I have um, uh, Speaker Suki approaches me down in the chambers before our session and he tells me that why am I not, you know, being a team player or talking story with the other chair? And I said, Speaker, what are you talking about? I don't understand what you're saying. And he says, oh, your committee is giving me a headache. And I'm like, really? So I asked him what was the problem. So he didn't express himself anymore. But apparently, from listening to his choice of words, he already had you know, chosen sides. And he didn't listen to what I had to say. And because you know, I really come from the really Hawaiian you know, perspective on how to mitigate conflicts, I would have, for me as a leader, I would have brought everybody to the table and discussed what was the major issue and why does the bill have to be passed out. And then later on, they, tell, they keep telling me, oh, I need to sign off on the committee report. And then I refuse to sign off on the committee report. And then later on, they tell me, oh, the bill needs to pass out. So can you just defect the date? And I says, no, I cannot do that because they'll be wasting taxpayers' money and people's time. And so I just stood my ground because for me, that was pono. And I felt good on my decision making after weighing out all of the facts. Because I'm a, I'm a really detailed person and I really look at all of the facts before I make what, decisions. What was it about that beach bill that really set you off? The beach bill really set me off because when Rep. Evans decided to um, define beaches as submerged, included submerged lands, she had no jurisdiction in that area. Submerged lands belong to the public and that's in our state constitution. And also, um, what another trigger on that bill was that we have to remember we're island states so all of our islands are impact so we can never have policies that one size fits all because it's not conducive and so I had concerns about my cliffs my lava cliffs were they going to be considered as beaches because the bill was just to 
deny people from smoking in their cigarettes. So to me, that piece didn't make sense and we could have done it better on an outreach educational line where we could have gone into the schools and educated our K-12 to students and they could go home and deliver the message to their parents because their parents are the only ones that have the age to buy cigarettes. You know, as I'm listening to all this, I see that there seems to be a trend at the legislature that you're bucking up against where they kind of want the Big Island delegation to scratch each other's backs. And if, if um, you don't really go with your colleague here on the Big Island's legislation, then you're not considered a team player. But here you are, like, standing up on the principle of you don't like the bill. Well, I don't like the bill because it doesn't benefit the people. Because I'm elected by the people and I work for the people. I'm not working for the colleague that is my counterpart. I mean, that's irrelevant. And that bill would have jeopardized the Puna people because of the cliffs and because but of the merge land. They're saying you're not a team player because yes. you're not willing to sit down with her and try to make her bill. Well, better. it works both ways. You know, people need to come to terms and take away all the emotions and come to the table, like I said, in a loving and peaceful way. And then we can move forward to all Pono Pono, make it correct. And then we can have better sound sound decisions. Going back a little bit to last session, you were in the news about the... Well, that was also places. mischaracterized. Yeah, and the, so and, the, to kind of and the content was not about people. It was about the people that did, that they had used to create the arts, you know, to the collection. And a lot of these people weren't really connected to Hawaii. They were only connected because they were here, you know, whether they were visiting or whether they had a position at the university, you know, as a professor or as a chancellor. So they got to be the ones that were juried to do the arts. And so I, when I was looking for Native Hawaiian um, artists, a lot of our artists I found are not juried because the criteria for them is hard to get because they have to participate in a lot of different exhibits to qualify. And the cultural and arts does not provide that opportunity for our Kanaka Maoli artists to get that opportunity of being, so that they can get classified as juried. And also the inventory at the cultural and the arts is not, you know, it needs to be updated because they're still using typewriters and carbon papers to do their work. It's not even digitized. And if you go to them and ask them for a specific um, piece, the first thing that will come out of their mouth is, we don't have it. And then you send them off to go look for it, and indeed they do have it because they have it in storage, but because their inventory is not fluid where you could just put in the number and see where the location is. It's not even up to that par. So for me, we need to do a two-year moratorium to upgrade the systems instead of buying more arts because we are running out of places to storage. So, I mean, which is more important, updating the inventory or buying more arts and storing it? And yet they said, you know, the people that came to me, you know, when they mischaracterized me, it was so funny because even if I used the word Jap, you know, which is prevalent in my, you know, local community, everybody understands, but they don't get offended. And, you know, just for clarity, I am Japanese. So, I mean, and then even the word Haole, I am Caucasian. So how can I be a racist against myself? So racist is only a word that people use when they're on the mask, their real self of being a racist. So they use the word, because racist doesn't even exist in my vocabulary, I'm sorry. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears that ever since that um, incident last session, you've been really making a point of trying to make a point. 
Right, and, I, and all I'm trying to do is educate people so I do not be misunderstood. And yet, I followed all the protocol of our house leadership with Speaker Suki, Representative Saiki, of apologizing and all of that. And yet, I still get thrown under the bus. Media, instead of letting it bring to closure, they don't because they need news to sell their wares, whether it's video, whether it's a television, whether it's the magazines, whether it's the newspapers. So, you know, I had the opportunity to do Kahu Alelo Okala, the Hawaiian word of the day. So I did one of the words called Mahaoi, which means rude. And so I used it in a sentence and I said, Mahaoi na kanaka no pepa. The reporters are rude. And that was so fitting because they are. And they're only here to get a story, nothing more. They don't care about your integrity. They don't care about your dignity. If they can strip you, they would rape you right in front of the cameras. So right now, I have no trust in these people. And I'm glad I have a good friend like Tiffany Edwards who understand where I'm coming from. Plus she's one of my constituents and she took the time to at least understand what's really happening and clarifying a lot of the things that have been done in the past. And we don't need another overthrow of government. So how do you how do you feel like um, you can assure your constituents that you represent everyone and not just the Hawaii? Oh, I do represent everyone. If you look at my track records, I have passed out a bill in human trafficking, passed out some bills in our kupuna, our keiki caucuses, our women's caucus, contraceptives. Um, we have been passed out Muslim Day. I mean, I'm just very progressive in a lot of the things I've done. Plus, also, when we came up with the Public Land Development Corporation, I was of nine of my colleagues that voted it down. And so it passed out in, you know, 2012. And then last session, 2013, we removed it and repealed it. And I did have a repeal bill during 2012, which I had stuck into another um, open, because the title was broad, I could stick it in, and it went to Finn, but then I guess Finn wasn't ready to repeal it. Yeah, and then after it, I find out all the facts of whys and stuff. So, you know, for me, if people give me, and they're true to themselves, they're transparent and accountable, and they give me all the right facts, and none of these, none of these kind of shenanigans. Then I can make sound decisions. But when people try to feed you, you know, lies or half truths, it's very hard for us as legislatures to really make sound decisions. So a lot of times, when my colleagues vote, a lot of them don't know what they're voting for. But if you watch me on Olelo TV, you will see you will see me standing up for a lot of Kanaluas, which is with reservations only because the bills need a lot of work to be done or there's some facts that have been left out or if i go on a straight kako ole which is no it'll mean that i did vet out all of the point of views and found that the bill would not benefit all of the people of hawaii or sometimes the bill is just um, self-interest groups or sometimes because the finance value of that policy increases, like how they had increased vehicle registrations, which I did not vote up on. You can check my records. There's a lot of things. I'm, I'm just one of those legislatures that vote for the people, really for the people, because I don't want you to spend more, waste our tax monies when we, should, when we could be feeding the homeless. We could be clothing the keiki that really need some clothes or they need some medical help. I mean, it's not about me. I, I have no agenda. This is really about the future generations that are coming. Now, Mamo. Well, uh, as a Kanaka Makua, I, you did mention that you would like to see the Department of Land and Natural Resources um, get better um, training as far as Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian cosmology. Would you? Would you like to see the other departments as well? Well, they all need to. Training? They all need to d do that. And OHA has been giving classes um, to some of the grants to our um, Richardson Law School. And I did attend one of those workshops 
in January. That's why I couldn't attend the opening of our Hawaiian language building. Yeah, Kaula uh, Kaili Kolani. So I was at um, Richardson and we did discuss water issues, land issues, Ivi Kupuna burials, and you know, and um, kingdom laws that have been brought forth into our constitution and customary and traditional rights, Article 12, Section 7. You, you wrote a statement um, regarding the disciplinary action by the House leadership, and you ended it recalling um, your once good relationship you had with the chair, Joseph Suki, um, on his committee of transportation when you served on that committee. And you said, um, he was a man who understood the importance of protecting this house as an institution and the necessity of setting aside petty politics for the public good. How times have changed, Speaker Suki, and how disappointed I am. Where are we going from here? Well, for me, you know, I have already set all of this, I call it Opala rubbish to the side. I mean, I already brought closure to all of it because as long as I'm in my state of Malugia and Lokahi and being Pono with who I am, it doesn't matter where I go because it's only for the good. Do you feel like you'll be able to continue to work with your Of colleagues? course. I've been just working because yesterday alone, I think I produced about 10 different resolutions. <laughs> How are you able to, I guess, from your point of view, transcend the pe pettiness when every day there seems to be a new... It doesn't matter to me. For me, pettiness, if they want to be kukamali and be childish, that's fine. They choose their path. I chose the path of being kealapono, the right path, and to just be who I am. And I'm not going to change for nobody because I am... Yeah, I'm an elected official and I'm here for the people and to do the work of the people and in their best interest of everything that I have done for the people. So I have no regrets of what have happened. It's just that, you know, there's miscommunications and leadership should have been responsible for creating this chaotic situation, which they could have done. And then, you know, because we don't have really good leadership, alaka'is, if we can mold better alaka'is for the future, and I think that's something the Department of Education might be able to do with our kamali'i, our children that are growing up, and having more role models, and also, well, because I'm really into the Hawaiian, you know, for me it's like onipa being steadfast, and kulia ikanu strive for the highest. I mean, I live those models. You know, people say it, but they don't live it. A lot of these, um, all of these proverbs and wise sayings, you know, I truly live it. And I truly live a lot of the values that are expressed, the values of aloha, the values of lokai, the values of everything that makes me who I am. And these were all our my makana from my ancestors. So, so the op opposite of pono, absolute correctness, is yes. kala, right? Yes, and then there's only two, two things in, in life, really. Either you're going to be in the Western world, which is about the kala, the monies, the anunu, the greed, the corporate world, the hookuku, the competitiveness, the lili, the jealous. So we need to transcend back into kanaka maoli, which is all about being pono, being at your state of maluhia, being lokahi, I mean, all the positive values that we all should be living today. And that's what it's all about. So do you feel like all of this is getting lost in translation? Maybe? Well, it doesn't matter because the people that don't get it, you know, the po'e nalowale, that are lost, they'll be lost until they find who they truly are. And a lot of people um, don't have a self-identity. They don't know who they are. So they really don't know who they're where they're going, because in order to do that, you have to be pono with oneself. If you're not pono with yourself, you don't find your malu here early, then you can never assist others because all of these other wrongful doings, these hevas, are gonna just keep you back because you are not open and you haven't brought closure to things that should have been um, you know, corrected early. 
And there are people that take their, um, their grief and the emotions to the graves without bringing closure. And, and that's really tragic. A good example is like we have children that go to Kamehameha preschools and then they try to get into the kindergarten. And it's really tragic because they treat the children like they're a number. They give them this westernized testing. And because a child doesn't meet the westernized testing, they get rejected. And yet, they're part of Powahi's Kamali children, you know, not Puoka. <laughs> you know, Powahi, and I just don't get it. So I did express that to Kamehameha schools. And of course, you know, they're, they're trying to defend it. But the problem is a lot of our native Hawaiians that get educated, they're not immersed enough to assist their own people, which is a tragic, because they become so westernized and they forget that there's other best practices that prevailed here before they were even born. So um, do you feel like a ho'oponopono is in order here? Well, that, that would be great. We should come to the pakaukau kau and kuka kuka and throw away all the opala. But I, like I said, I already did all mine, so I'm, I'm okay. I don't know about them, you know? It's, if they're still taking me home, that's fine. That's their, you know, pilikia. I'm moving on, I'm holomo already. I'm ola. <laughs> ola is what? Ola, I'm, You're okay. I'm okay, I'm healthy, I brought closure, yes. Is there any other um, point that you want to get across to um, the people of Hawaii or even... Yes, I would like to get the point across that if you are or somebody new that have come here, like the Malahini, then you really need to immerse yourself so you can be part of the community. You shouldn't come here with values that you think is right, but yet it was already vetted here, and that's why we don't do those practices, or you need to understand that you are a Malahini, you cannot become a Kama'aina. And the real question is going to be this, are you going to die here? Are you going to be a stakeholder here? Are you going to be committed to our land? Because this is the most beautiful place in the, on earth. And we should be the state of Maluhia, state of Aloha, the state of Lokahi, these are our profound values that's in our indigenous culture, the host culture. And then people shouldn't just be using the host culture and says, oh, we had a good Hawaiian experience, but what is it? What is a good Hawaiian experience? Is it because you had fun at the drinking Mai Tais, fun playing the ukulele, fun dancing, or you had good memories? But what is that real memory? So when you came here, did you leave Hawaii in a better state or did you make it worse? That's the question for all of them. So are you here to contribute, to make it a better place to live? Or are you coming here to break up what we have? Oh, and and the, only, the only other question that I have after you say that, which it's a, it's a, good, it's a good ending note, but um, we have such a transient community. Exactly. In Exactly. And so I, I, I and understand I the message that you're giving them, but um, what should they, what should they know about you and you if they are registered voters with that point of view? Oh well, they, they, they should represent that. They, they, they yes, I, I do represent. Like I said earlier, I do represent all the people. Yeah. Yes. But you, it, it almost is as if. Um, you 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 feel like you're in the position where you need to educate them. You cannot just right. allow and if, them to And if I didn't take. care about them, I wouldn't educate them. I would just let them hang and try to figure out and then there'll just be more mental health problems on the streets. <laughs> That's what's gonna happen. And we haven't given enough monies for that type of programs. And I've keep pushing for more of these services because we you know like our population in the prisons, in the facilities, the correctional facilities are too high, plus Native Hawaiians are high. But we haven't done our job in public safety because we haven't treated our people with dignity and also healed their broken spirits.
that's what it's all about. In a way, do you feel like you're um, you're helping to mend these people's broken spirits? Definitely. By, by, um, yeah. Referring to the Hawaiian language on a regular basis on, on the count on the floor. On oh the yes, floor. because it brings back you know the the true values of what these islands were before colonization or before you know invasion by the outsiders. And do you feel like mo people are mostly supportive of, of the position that you've taken? Yes, because I can be walking all over the place and then I'll get somebody that that give me a compliment. Thank you for standing up for us. I mean, yesterday that was happening all day and people I don't even know. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. To well, well, you know, thank you for taking the time to let me present my side of the story because all of the other medias did not do it. They tried to um, put things in that's not there, which is kind of crazy because I'm so upfront. Okay. And so um, are you gonna maybe suggest the Ho'oponopono or? Well, actually, you know, the solution for them, we gave them the solution where leadership needs to be accountable for their actions. But when people try to defend themselves and hide behind a person for the person to be the scapegoat, that's unacceptable, not in my books. Yeah. So you'll just continue to um, run your committee meetings with or without a monitor? Yes. I'll just continue to do the work that I was elected for because I'm pretty sure a lot of the other communities, you know, the other districts, <laughs> they probably would like to have a representative like me because I'm speaking for them, you know, and I'm not afraid to say what I need to say. But a lot of people are because of election year. And whether I get elected or not, it doesn't matter to me because I really done what I needed to do. I completed my career. I'm already on retirement. I actually can just sell away. I mean, I have assets that if I wanted to leave today, you know, and get rid of Hawaii, I could go and go live on an island. Do you feel <laughs> like you want to seek re-election? Well, I am already putting my paperwork, and I will let the people decide. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, your last statement could be misinterpreted, like you don't want to continue, you're kind of ready to retire. It's no, but I'm, all I'm saying, the statement was just to be said that I don't really have to be in this arena, but I choose to be here only because this is my, my giving back to the community that has supported me for the last 60 years. So we can expect you to continue to be in your essence of really advocating for the Hawaiian, the, the Renaissance. It's for the Renaissance and, and for what our lack of infrastructures and services in Puna, basically. Like for example, the booster club that needs to be created. So that's another thing I've been working on. I mean, there's a lot of different things people don't know that I've been working on. And yes, I have laid a lot of foundation. That's why now we're going to open up Kulani Correctional Facility. And then we're going to use the whole Oponopono program. Because when I was chair of public safety, that was one of my um, priorities. And then when they started to close it down, I had a big fight about not closing it down. And then we be, luckily we changed into a different um, governor. So now we had the opportunity to reopen it. And I told them in the beginning, it wasn't conducive for children to be there because of with the, the youth challenge. Yeah, youth challenge because it was far away, no medical services, too cold. But were these adults listening? No. And I've lived there, you know, for 25 years. So you doubting me? I live because I work three watches, you know, through the midnights and all, and through the Mr. Frost on the grounds and the coldness and the wind and you know all the different weathers but when people are not listening then they don't care. Would you support that pool idea for that place? Yes I do but it needs to be run by somebody who truly believes in it but now we have all these what I call ulinas all these plastics trying to act like it's a pool and then the program you know so we need to 
really uh, monitor it very well from the beginning. Plus, I know there's going to be challenges with the administration because I already got the phone calls. Then I get some people asking me, are you going to go back and work there? And I'm like, well, you know, that's going to be a big decision, yeah, for me. It depends where I want to be. Yes. Well, again, thank you for taking the time to sit with us and take so much um, time to explain your perspective. We really appreciate you. Well, thank you for taking the time, too, and for letting me express myself.